Good evening, and welcome to our Bible study. I'm Pastor A.D., Pastor of Truth on NBC here in Houston, Texas, and I thank you so much for joining us for our Bible study. And today, we're still in the book of Titus, the book of Titus, chapter 3, chapter 3, verses 3 through 8, chapter 3, verses 3 through 8, and that's the book of Titus. Today's topic is the Christian's responsibility in an evil world and worldly society, and in an even evil and worldly society, very evil. As you know, as we live in a very evil world, very evil. And so, of course, I have an overview. I'm going to pray and we'll jump right into it. Lord, I thank you so much for everything. Lord, continue to God to bless us and keep us, watch over us. Lord, we thank you, Lord, for the word of God, that God teaches us how to be responsible believers in Christ, that God teaches us how to be responsible for your word, how to live, how to treat others, Lord, how to love. We love you so much and we thank you in Jesus' name we pray. Amen, amen, amen. Living in a evil and worldly society, Christians living in a evil and worldly society. So what's our responsibility in a society like this? What are we supposed to do living in this world that's evil? What should we do? How should we um, approach life? How, what should we do? How should we interact in life as believers in Christ? And so we're going to look at it. So let's start with the overview. Paul's letter to this young man in faith ministering on the island of Crete to carry on the work there in a fashion that would bring honor to God. The book of Titus, we're looking at chapter three and examining the first eight verses under the theme, the Christian's responsibility in an evil and worldly society. So I just will remind you of the general tone with which we approach this particular verses, okay? Um, New Testament churches were small, small islands in a sea of paganism. Um, you see, they existed in an absolutely pagan culture, very pagan. You see, they existed in a very absolutely pagan culture. The Gentile world knew nothing about the Bible. It knew nothing about biblical morality. It knew nothing about Christian values. It knew nothing about a godly sense of mercy or justice. It knew nothing about a proper understanding of freedom within the framework of moral code. It was purely and totally and comprehensively and utterly pagan. These churches were born then in a culture with no Christian influence. There was no cultural Christianity. There was no Christian influence on social behavior or on the belief systems. The, Christ, the Gentile world was literally engulfed in idolatry, all of it designed by Satan. Their cultures were totally controlled by a satanic agenda, worked out through utterly and totally depraved human beings involved in worshiping demons. So the churches then were in direct opposition in contrast to everything within the framework of cultural life. Given that obvious understanding, they we might assume if we listen to the Christians today in America that the early church should have made its primary agenda to impact culture, to try to get various nations into which the church had been born, adopt some kind of politically Christian agenda. Somehow the early church, some would seemingly want to tell us, should have put together some kind of biblical morality, some kind of biblical value system, and work very hard to get the nations to adopt that biblical moral code. However, the early church never did that. It had nothing to do with it. They did not concern itself with the whatever moral code of the nation was. It was not concerned about social behavior. It was not trying to influence culture politically or judicially or legislatively. The early church existed to do one thing, that and that was to reach lost people with the gospel. That was the beginning and the end of their purpose, and that is still the church's purpose. That is still our only purpose. That is why we are in the world. It is not necessarily important that the church somehow impact its culture to make it superficially Christian. That is not our goal. That is not our agenda. That is not our purpose. It's been a nice thing for those of us who live in America to have had Christianity influence our life as a nation. And we are a nation founded by people who wanted Christian freedom. And they wrote things in the early documents of our nation to preserve Christianity at least as much as they could so that our culture has been influenced by the Bible, by Christian values and Christian standards. And those things have become an important component in our society. Now, we all know 
that's changing and it's changing very rapidly and it's changing right before our very eyes. We are nearly fully secular and whatever remains to be done to make us um, highly secular, we are rapidly doing it. America is abandoning its Christian influence as fast as it as possibly can. It is, it's going away. It is vanishing. And we are all being faced with some very disturbing changes. Those of us who are Christian don't like this. We, we have a sort of assumed that a nation should be as Christian as it is possible possibly could be, although the, that assumption is not certain at a biblical one. We, we like it that way. Now it's changing and it tends to make us sad, even angry at times. We watch biblical standards being replaced systematically by anarchy, by total moral freedom without any seeming moral limits in this per pervasive uh, mentality of equal rights that makes everybody to an egotist, um, demanding his own rights, whatever they are de deemed to be. And if you say to the, to the event, average person, what is a Christian? How many of those layers are there? Are they going to have to search through to find the reality? We must reject our confused loyalties. Um, we must reject our compound concerns with regard and passing the world. We must reject all efforts of externally change uh, culture. And we must get on about doing what we're supposed to be doing as believers in Christ. The great Billy Graham once said, so long as the gospel remains the gospel and the church the church, so long as the church of God is need of reformation, the world of mission, and one last person of salvation, there will always be a future for those who seek to define themselves by the gospel itself, end quote. So he's right. We cannot afford to weaken our spiritual mission. We cannot afford to obscure our priority of gospel proclamation. We cannot afford to become confused about which kingdom we belong to by getting involved in efforts to change cultural norms, cultural morals, cultural values, cultural behaviors. And certainly we can't get so engulfed in that we become the enemies of the very people we seek to win to Christ. We can and we must reject sin as sin, and, but we do not engage in defamation, destruction, and efforts to superficially change a culture. The task of evangelizing the lost calls for focus on that very thing. If someone says to me, what do you do? As people often do, um, and then you should be, uh, the reaction should be the common question that men get asked. I could say, well, I'm a minister in a church who knows what uh, that would mean and, and who knows what, what they think. It's better if I say I, I preach the gospel. That's what I do. I declare the good gospel. I preach the good news. I preach the word of God. That's what I do. And that's the end of conversation. And <laughs> that is, by the way, a very fast way into a conversation <laughs> on the right subject. Certainly Paul's, Paul was uh, consumed with this very, very singular mandate of evangelism when he wrote this letter to Titus. And he is very concerned that the people living in the pagan culture of Crete, which was utterly pagan without any Christian influence at all, now get engaged in trying to moralize cultural behavior. That they not get involved in trying through the political avenues to create about was that they be able to demonstrate to their society that God saves people from sin and, and that the primary way, primary way to do that was to demonstrate a saved life. So the best way to do it is to demonstrate it, demonstrate, be a demonstration of it. We can talk about it all day, but we must be a demonstration of it. So let's look at verse three. For we ourselves were also once foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving various lusts, and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another. So let's look at verse three that's dissected. And it says, listen before you get slanderous, before you get angry at those in authority, your country and those around you and who are in sin and those who have a moral agenda, before you get hostile and slanderous, angry, and before you comfort those kinds of emotions that lead to venomous kinds of acts and thoughts of vengeance before you become inconsiderate, before you fight for a cultural Christian agenda, before you attack the ungodly and attack the unsaved. Paul says, remember once you were one of them. I love that scripture. It was a scripture that, that's very close to this. 
And it says, um, you once were something. You once were lost. You once were this. You know. So remember that. Keep that in mind. Did you forget? Did you forget? Did you forget that you used to be like that and you couldn't do anything about it? And, and there you uh, have, in, in verse 3, another one of those lists that Paul loves to give. You find them in Romans 1, in 1 Corinthians 6, Galatians 5, Ephesians 4. One of those lists that defines the universal and comprehensive um, death of human fallenness. All of us were like that. Paul himself it was a blasphemer. He says in 1 Timothy 1, in a persecutor and a violent, and a violent aggressor. But he did it ignorantly in belief. He didn't know any better. As if to say, I mean, I did it because I didn't know any better. And, and you look at the gay agenda, the homosexual agenda, and you watch the homosexual pride parade, and you listen to all the lesbian advocacies and and you see all the playboy mentality and and the filth and the porno, pornos of, of our time and you watch the agenda being pushed on the social institutions and on children movies and 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 you see the children and, and everything for their sex education passing out birth control devices all these different things stuff going on and something in you become hostile to all of that and you've got to stop and realize that people doing that uh, are doing in utter ignorance and it's exactly what you used to do and what you used to believe in and we got to think of it like that that's exactly what we used to believe in what we used to do for the world we was in the world working for the enemy so look at verse three you were once foolish what does that mean you were once foolish they lack understanding they are completely ignorant that's anatos in greek without knowledge anatos without understanding they don't know what they are doing they are ignorant, just like we once were. You know, we were, but we were washed by the blood of the Lamb. We once was that, you know, and that's the thing. We got to keep that in mind at all times. Ephesians 4 and 18 says basically the same thing that the Gentiles are darkened in their understanding, excluded from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them, because of the hardness of their hearts. Remember, the Gentiles have yet to be reached. So that's what the apostles were doing, especially Paul and Peter. And John, they began to go out and reach the Gentiles. Remember, Jesus' ministry was to the lost sheep of Israel, the Jews. That's who his ministry was for. And that's who he came for, the lost sheep of Israel. He, he died for everybody. However, his ministry was to the Jews. And so he came to the Jews. And naturally, they cannot understand the things of God, says Paul in his letter to the Corinthians. And that's why we call Apostle Paul. He's our apostle to the Gentiles. So what do you expect? As soon as you knock... Um, the opinions out from under the cultural Christianity and there aren't any restraints, their ignorance is going to take over. As soon as there's no compelling biblical criteria, they're left to their own devices. And this is what you should expect. This is unbelievers acting like unbelievers, right? We expect that. This is depravity manifesting itself. I suppose you thought that somehow the more intelligent people became, the more likely they were to approximate a biblical morality. Wrong. Absolutely wrong. If you want a good insight into that, just look around. <laughs> That's all you got to do. Look around. <laughs> Look around and, and just look how people are. And um, and the worse, it, it, it gets worse. It gets worse. And the thing about it is going to happen. Things is going. This world is going to get worse. It's going to get worse because it has to lead up to God's second coming. Jesus second coming. It has to lead up to his second coming. And so here's probably the foremost historian. And we must realize the Western civilization, if you ever took that up in school, I have in, in, co in college, Liberty University, you will go through the most um, unbelievable morass of filth and reading about the intellectual, the, the um, philosophical artifacts of contempor contemporary Western culture. And you will find out that those men who were smart enough to design the whole culture in which you live were the most debauched human beings on the face of the earth. And their, lives and their lives would make a black mark on a piece of coal. Intelligence and education has nothing to, do to contribute to morality. Now, I think we're shocked. I think when you look at institutions of higher education, because we assume there is some something um, so reasonable about biblical morality, so intelligent about biblical morality that the smart people who study carefully could would come to wise conclusion, but they cannot override their depravity. They're ignorant. 
Um, no matter how educated, no matter how many PhDs they have, they, they're blind and they're ignorant and darkened. And what do, you, do we expect from them? Nothing more than what their, their own depravity could engineer. Then he says they are disobedient to God. Of course, consequently, of all authority instituted by God. And there is the heart of man rebellion, right? It is bound up in his heart. It is bound up in his fallenness. That's why you spank your children to knock the rebelliousness under some control. But where God isn't there, the spirit isn't there to restrain it. Lawless uh, resistance through truth and virtue will run amok. And that is is just depravity doing what depravity does. And we haven't seen it fully in America in the past because we did have some residue of Christian constraint in the system. That is all gone. And now we're going to see depravity like it was seen in pagan Greek culture. We will be more the kind of church the church used to be in its early beginnings. They are disobedient. They are disobedient to God. And to authority. They care not for the Bible. They laugh and mock at scripture overtly and coverly. They are resistant to truth and virtue. Then he says, thirdly, they are deceived. That's the verb again that gives us the world planet. They just wander around in space. They are not moored. They are not anchored. They just wander. They just wander. It literally means they are led astray. They are perverted in mind and will will and action. Their major thing is freedom. They just want to roam at all their impulses. Nothing holds them down. Nothing quantifies their life. Nothing qualifies their life. They just live at whim, whatever they feel, how they feel. Um, they are deceivers and they are deceived and they get worse and worse. Second Timothy 3 and 13 says, and and, and also Romans and 1 says, Romans chapter 1 talks about that. Now, what's driving them, if they're ignorant and disobedient and deceived, they can't know the truth. They don't want to do the truth. They're led into all kinds of error. What is drive? What is the driving force? Here it is. They're enslaved to various lusts and pleasures, various lusts, a multitude of different uh, epithemias, 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 that is in Greek, evil desires. Okay, it might be for money, it might be for sex, it might be for lesbian sex, it might be for homosexuality among men, it might be for power, it might be for food, it might be for alcohol, it might be for drugs, it might be for the murder, for murders, it might be for rape, it might be for who knows what all. They are driven by the only impulse they have within them, and that is their lust. And, the, and he adds pleasures from which we get the word hedonism, hedonism, hedone, 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 pleasures. They live for what makes them feel good. And, and as a result, they will spend, he says, this is all of us. We also, we're spending our life also, right? We, we were doing two. We, we were once there. And now he says, um, not saying we did it now and then, or we once did it, or we might do it, or there's a chance we could do it. He's saying we did it all our life in malice and envy. Malice means just plain wickedness. Kakea, kakea in Greek, deep wickedness. But it has the idea of malicious wickedness that wants to hurt and harm and take what it wants at the price, at any price, really for another to pay. There were seven virtues in, in verses one and two and seven vices in verses three. And now there are seven aspects of salvation in verses four through seven. It's like one sentence. Verses four through seven is one sentence. One long sentence that sweeps over the reality of salvation to remind us that the only reason we're different is because of God, not us, right? Because of God. Nothing is, is worse than smug self-righteousness. Nothing is worse than Christians sitting around damning all the unconverted people because of the fact that they were um, better than they are. And listen, my friend, the only reason you're not one of them on the way uh, to hell is because of God's grace. You got to remember that because of God's grace and his mercy. And that's the only reason we're not on the way to hell. Verse four, but when the kindness and love of God, our Savior toward man appeared, let's read verse five, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us 
though the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit, six verse, whom he poured out on us abundantly through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Seventh verse, that having been justified by his grace, we should become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. So let's look at these, four through seven. The only reason you're an heir, the only reason you have hope, a hope of eternal life, and the only reason you're justified, made right with God, and the only reason that you have come through Jesus Christ is to receive the Holy Spirit. The only reason why that happened, you've been renewed, regenerated, washed. The only reason is the only reason you're saved is because God is merciful. His grace and his mercy, his mercy is, is new every single day. So that's the only reason why we are saved is because of God's grace and his mercy. That's what he's saying. Now, you know, this particular passage of scripture is a heaven sort uh, to theology. There is so much <clears throat> here you could spend the rest of your life in those verses. It sweeps across the great glorious truths of salvation. Now, I'm not going to take the time to do that, and we'll get into it next time. We'll keep going and going in the book of Timothy till we complete it. But for now, I want you to feel the impact of the, of the whole of what he is saying. So follow me through these verses again. Salvation was initiated by God. Verse 4, when the kindness of God, our Savior, and his love for mankind appeared. The initiative is with God. He came into the world showing his kindness and his love and incarnation in Christ. He saved us, right? And again, his... Is uh, <clears throat> it's not on the basis of something which we had done, which was righteous. It wasn't because we were so good, on and on, on and on. It's not because of that. It's because according to his mercy. It's according to his mercy, not according to your deeds and how much you give to the poor and all. That doesn't matter. It's according to his mercy. Christ paid it all. He washed us. He regenerated us. He renewed us through the Holy Spirit. He poured out his spirit on us through Christ. He justified us by his grace. He made us heirs and he gave us the hope of eternal life. It's all from him and by him through him. It's in the cross, through the cross and on the cross that we are saved. Nothing else. There's nothing more. So would you look at the unbeliever like that? Would you say to yourself, he's not like me? Listen carefully, because God has not done for him what he's done for you. You need to view him like that. And when you are repulsed by the media and their anti-Christian agenda, when you are repulsed by the homosexuals and the lesbians and the fornicators and adulterers, all of that, the educators and whoever else, the politicians, um, when you look at them and simply say they're the way they are because God has not saved them. I'm not that way. I'm that way. I am that way. I'm that way because he saved me and, and get that perspective. Of course, I'm going to say I'm not that way. Of course, they're not that way. They're not going to be that way until God saved them. If he decides to save them, if their names are written in the Lamb's book of life, then he will save them. If not, they will go to a damning hell. And when the kindness, verse four says of God, our savior, his love for mankind appeared, what a statement, what a great statement. Salvation is rooted in the love of God. Salvation is rooted in the love of God. That's whose name has been written in the Lamb's book of life before the foundations of this world. So his love, everything was written in the salvation of God. So it's there. And there he gave us Christ. It is God's kindness and God's love that our salvation resides. For God so loved the world, right? And it is our, it is God, our Savior, verse 10 of chapter 2. It is Christ, our Savior, verse 6 of chapter 3. As we've seen those same descriptive terms of God and Christ throughout the pastoral epistles. It all originates with them. And his love appeared. His kindness appeared. His, and he has, what, saved us. He has delivered us. We have redemption. It is God who is the rescuer. He rescued us from hell, from sin. God came down and rescued us. Remember? Verse 5. Verse 5. We read it already. Not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercies, he saved us through the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit. So it says he saved us. Let's, let's look at that. He saved us. That little, that little three letters, three words, rather he saved us. Take us to the cross, the resurrection. He did it. He did it. Not on the basis of deeds. Again, not on the basis of deeds, which Catholics believe in. It's not about your deeds. It's not about your works, which we have done. We didn't deserve our salvation. 
We didn't deserve our transformation. Our deliverance from sin and death, hell, was purely on God's love and God's kindness alone. Nothing in us was worthy. We made no contribution to his plan. We made no contribution to his choice. We made no contribution to his works of salvation. He looked at us in pity and compassion and love and mercy and saved us. We deserve wrath. We got forgiveness. We are undeserved. We receive what we do not earn. In fact, his mercy was influenced and his grace was absolutely spontaneous. And yet he washed us. And the agent of washing is the word. He regenerated us. That speaks about the new birth. He renewed us. All of that really looks at the same event. We were washed. That's one way to look at salvation. It's the cleansing of sin. We were regenerated. That's another way to look at salvation. It's a new birth, a new life, a polygonesia, polygonesia. That's in Greek. That's marvelous word. And then we were renewed. That's another way to look at the same event. We came out of the experience in newness of life. We now are living a life on a completely different plane. All of the speaks of radical um, transformation initiated by God, not according to anything we've done. We were radically transformed, okay? And then we were infused with the Holy Spirit who was poured out on us richly. We were then made right with God through all of that. Verse seven says, and became joint heirs with Christ in the hope of eternal life. All of that is simply to say one thing. Look, the only reason you're different uh, than the corrupt society around us is because God saved you. That's the only reason God saved you. So we're sinners saved by grace. We're sinners saved by grace. So how can you hate those people who have never, who you've never known the mercy of, who never known the mercy of God? How can you do that? Can't you feel the same pity, the same compassion that God felt toward you when He saved you? And then in verse eight, the first little statement. This is a trustworthy statement. Stop there. That really belongs in verses four through seven. That little phrase. This is a trust, trustworthy statement. Is a descriptive phrase used five times in pastoral epistles, um, First and Second Timothy and Titus, and it is used to identify a commonly known expression that was axiomatic. And when you say something is axiom, you mean it is self-evident truth that doesn't need proof. It's just obvious. Apparently, in the early church, there were a number of self-evident axioms, axioms that had found their way into the repetitive vocabulary of Christians, and they would um, frequently recite them. This appears to have been one of those from verses four through seven. Some think it was a part of creed, part of a creed, a commonly recited creed in the early church. Others think it may well have been a part of a hymn to a song. It was, uh, but it was one of those trustworthy statements. Sometimes you read that same phrase in Paul's letters to Timothy. This is a trustworthy statement and worthy of acceptance. It's the same basic phrase. It was something, excuse me, that was self-evident, something that everybody knew. He's simply saying, you all know this for sure. You are all you all know that salvation is by grace and grace alone. So before you become angry and hostile against the culture in which you, you live, remember that the part apart from the grace of God, that's you. That's you apart from grace of God. That's you. So how are we to live in a pagan society? That's the question. How are we to live in the pagan society? One, we remember our duty, right? Number one, we remember our duty. Number two, we remember our former condition. That helps us to understand they're only acting the way they act because that's the only way we can act. They can act, right? Because we once acted that way. We once was that. And so, and thirdly, number three, we remember our salvation. We remember our salvation. That it's only the grace of God that sets us apart from them. Only the grace of God that sets us apart from them. And as we have been pitied, so we should pity them. They are in pitiful, in our, they are in a pitiful condition, very pitiful. Finally, and fourthly, number four, if you want to live the way God wants you to live in a pagan culture, remember your mission. Remember your duty, your former condition, your salvation. Remember your mission. Very important. Remember your mission, your duty. Which are, what is your job? To be on missions, to be telling somebody about Jesus Christ. Number eight, verse eight, let's look at it. This is 
a faithful saying, and these things I want you, I want to affirm consistently that those who have believed in God should be careful to maintain good works. These things are good and profitable to man. So now he reminds Titus to remind the church of their mission. He says to them, he says to him concerning these things, what things, what things are we talking about? What things, Paul, what are we talking about? All the things he's been writing, certainly since chapter two, verse one, as for you, speak the things which are fitting for sound doctrine. Speak those things, everything regarding sound doctrine. And then he goes and gives him a lot of things in chapter two and then in chapter three. Now he comes back where he started in chapter two, verse one, saying concerning these things, I want you to speak confidently. Don't be hesitant. Preach these things with boldness and conviction. The Greek verb is very intensive. It has added in front of it, di, di, the intense proposition, and intensifies the verb. You are to speak confidently and intensely about these matters of Christian behavior. That's what the church is about. When church, when the church come together, it comes together to be exhorted. As we saw in chapter 2, verse 15, speak, exhort, reprove, and don't let anybody disregard you, your youth. You do that with authority, right? You remind them, verse one of chapter three. Now he says, you speak these things confidently. When the church comes together, the church is to be addressed. You need to be here every week so that you can be stimulated to love and good works. The matter of evangelism is a, is at stake and, and how you live your life is at stake. And you need to be stimulated week in and week out of godliness, to godliness. So he says to Titus, you speak these things confidently, these matters of behavior in the pagan culture and these matters of behavior in the church so that we talk about in chapter two. You speak them unhesitate, uh, unhesitatingly um, so that those who have believed God, that is a great phrase. Now, who have believed in God, but who have believed God? What is that? Those who take God at his word, that's a definition of Christians. Those who take God at his word, who are Christians? They're not just people who believe in God. A lot of people believe in God. Uh, the enemy believe in God. <laughs> They're people who take God's word seriously. They believe God when he speaks. 80% of people in America believe in God. But I'll promise you right now, a very small percentage believe God when he speaks. And that's the issue here. He talks about the believers who believe the word of God. And that's, that's what God speaks. God speaks. This is the word of God. This is God speaking the word of God. I'm not talking about you hear a voice. And no, I'm not talking about that. Then we're talking about the word of God. And this is the word of God. God speaks. He spoke out. He, he breathed out. And this was formed right here, the word of God. We don't need any extra revelation. All right. We don't need any extra revelation. We don't need nothing added to this. This is the word of God. This is the holy word of God. And it's complete. It's complete. Um, so we don't need to start the first, um, the foundation over again. We don't need to start the first level over again because we're, <laughs> we're way far from that. So they're going to take the lead in, in doing what is excellent. They're, they're going to give very careful, thoughtful, devoted attention to the matter of spiritual living. People who take God seriously are going to do that. Part of the problem in the church today, we've got people who say they believe in God, who say they're Christians, who are in the church, and they don't take God's word seriously, do they? They don't. They don't. But they're passed off as Christians, and that's part of the confusion in, in the society. You speak confidently and and, and you speak to the Christians, those who take God's word seriously, and, and they'll, be caref they'll, they'll be careful to engage in good deeds and these things that are good and profitable for man. What does that mean, though? What does that mean to be good and profitable for man? They, they lead to salvation of the lost souls because they demonstrate transformed lives. They bring light and life and peace and joy and salvation to others. We have a great challenge in our beloved country, and I think the church is missing the whole approach. We have an increasingly paganized nation, and some Christians are jumping on the political bandwagon trying to impact the culture, quote, unquote. That's not our goal. That's not our purpose. That's not our calling. Our other Christians are trying to um, come up with more clever strategy for evangelism and feel if, if they can 
uh, find all the marketing tools and all of the hot buttons and the push and, and the properly people are going to be saved because the technique is so clever. And so they turn to the church into an entertainment center for unbelievers who want to come and be entertained. And hopefully if they're entertained enough to get real happy and real enthusiastic, they'll decide that they want to become Christians. That's not how it's done. You might get a crowd. You might even preach the gospel and have some people saved, but you're going to have immature, carnal, ignorant believers whose lives are going to demonstrate to the culture the transforming, saving power of God. And when the church comes together, it comes together to be spoken to with boldness and called to holy living and out of the word of God, because those who take the word of God seriously are going to engage in the good deeds that are going to become good and profitable for the watching world. And that's the mandate. We can't just be sad. We can't certainly be hostile. We got to pray for those in our culture and our society who are lost. We've got to pity them and to love them with the love of God and show them Christ's saving power in our lives. The church does not need now to become more like the world. It needs to become utterly and distinctively the church so that there is such an obvious difference that the world can see it clearly. We've doing, we're doing exactly the opposite, and that's the, that's the tragedy. We're doing exactly the opposite, and that's the tragedy. For us here, we have a mandate. We can fix everything, but we can be what God wants us to be here. And God will, in his grace, use us to bring many to righteousness. Thank you so much. Amen, amen, amen. I pray that you receive this word, and I pray that you are a responsible, being a responsible Christian while living in this evil and worldly society. So do your part, do your part, play your part, do your part as a believer in Christ. Reach out to those, reach out to those who are um, going through, reach out to those who are in the world and really try to touch their lives in order to bring them to Christ. And uh, remember, have pity. Remember where you come from. Don't forget where you come from. Thank you so much. Tune in Friday for the word of God. Tune in Friday for the word of God to be encouraged, to be enlightened for the pastoral moment. I get the light and encouraged with the word of God. And then Sunday for the word of God. So tune in, tune in, tune in. We are steady moving on. We're steady um, um, reaching towards that prize, which is Christ Jesus. We're growing in the word of God and we want, and want you to grow with us. So please tune in and happy Mother's Day to all the mothers. I will say it again Friday, but happy Mother's Day to all the mothers, to my mom, my special mother. God bless you. I love you so much. Happy Mother's Day to my beautiful wife. Happy Mother's Day to all my aunties. Happy Mother's Day to all my friends um, and, and, and cousins. And happy Mother's Day. God bless y'all. May God continue to bless you. Um, to see many more Mother's Day that you be celebrated for who you are and what you have done for your children and others that are not your children. But thank you so much again. Tune in, tune in, tune in and share this channel, share this channel, share this channel with everybody. Share it, share it, share it with everybody. <laughs> Until next time, God bless you. May you have a blessed rest of your week. Remember to keep God first and do your responsibility, do your due diligence for Christ. Handle your business for Christ. Walk like Christ. Talk like Christ. Live like Christ. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. We are True Vine. We love you. We thank you for tuning in. You want to know why? Because we're True Vine and we are the Church of Love. God bless. Thank you so much for watching. Be sure to subscribe to this channel and join our online Christian family. Tithes, offerings, and donations can be made via Cash App at dollar sign tvmbc or by mail at true vine missionary baptist church 1407 grove street houston texas 77020 thank you so much and have a blessed day